Well, welcome everyone to Raise the Deschutes, our 10th, 8th, 9th series, ninth series this year. We're going, there's a, there's 100 people here tonight either in the room or online, so we figured we've had about 1,000 people watch at least the night of and who knows how many during. So we're just so thrilled that we had this many people who care about water. And thank you so much for continuing to show up for this. Uh, my name's Kate Fitzpatrick. I'm the executive director of the Deschutes River Conservancy. And tonight we've got a great presentation by two long timers in the basin who really pioneered one of the most important tools that you'll be hearing about, which is updating irrigation infrastructure to restore rivers and stretch water supplies. Um, I wanna start with a commitment. We honor the native people who have called this region home for thousands of years. We join them in stewardship of our rivers for the next seven generations. I also want to thank our sponsors tonight who allow us to keep doing this for free for the public. Um, first of all, tonight this is a little different. This is um, funded in part by a project funded through USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And Lars, raise your hand back there. He runs, <laughs> he's our local NRCS partner on that program. Um, City of Bend. Mount Bachelor and Sun Country Tours are co-sponsoring. Hand in Hand Productions, which is our awesome mat back there. Uh, open Space Event Studio, which um, helps us with this space. Patagonia, Central Oregon Intergovernmental Council, Mount Bachelor Rotary Club of Bend, Wanderlust Tours, and Remax Key Properties, who came in as a new sponsor. <clears throat> So I just want to do a shameless plug for the DRC's annual river celebration coming up May 4th. That's the River Feast event. If you're interested in a great dinner and night celebrating the river, go to our website. You can buy a ticket there. We would love to see you. And then I do have a joke. It was hard to find a joke about piping. <laughs> but I found one. Um, a man woke up to find out that he was connected to a constant source of water. He was quite irrigated by it. So before tonight, I just want to ask quickly, how many people here irrigate with a water right? Awesome. And how many people live on an irrigation canal or ditch? Even more. Okay, great. Good context for tonight. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our esteemed panel. Um, we have Ty Redfield on the end there. And Ty has owned his small farm since 1973 and was a flood irrigator up until 2017 when he switched over to pivot irrigation. He presently has the majority of his property leased uh, fun fact I just learned about Ty, his name came from being conceived in the Ty Valley of Oregon, and uh, he was grateful because just 15 miles down the road was a town called Doofer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did I get that right? <laughs> um, next, we have Mark Thaliker. He's been the manager of Three Sisters Irrigation District near Sisters since 1997. He's farmed and ranched in Central Oregon since 1988. Mark serves on several boards, including the Family Farm Alliance, the Oregon Water Resources Congress, and is actively involved in energy and water legislation. Mark's been a longtime partner. Um, I've known Mark a very long time, and he's really a leader in the basin. Uh, fun fact about Mark, he's uh, been to over 100 Grateful Dead shows. So <laughs> he's at heart a deadhead. <laughs> I think his brother went to 700 and something, so it runs in the family. <laughs> And last but not least is our fearless moderator and facilitator, Lisa Seals. Um, Lisa is a program manager at the DRC. She has a PhD in interdisciplinary ecology, focusing on collaborative water management and policy in Oregon, specifically the Deschutes Basin. Fun fact about Lisa, she sometimes disappears to crew on sailboats, and her most recent trip was with someone that she didn't know, um, and I think sailed with him the coast of Oregon and California. Port Townsend, Washington, to Portland, Oregon. So no lack of adventurous spirit with our intrepid facilitator. With that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Lisa to, to moderate the panel. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Kate. And thank you all very much for coming out tonight to hear about irrigation modernization. I know it doesn't sound like a super exciting topic, but at the end of the day, it is a very important tool in our toolkit of how we are going about saving water in the basin and reallocating it to meet all of the needs. So um, yeah, I am supposed to tell you all that the handouts on your tables um, are basically cliff notes from all of the different seminars that we've put together. So that's, that, that's what they are. Um, so I think each seminar has about a page, give or take. 
So um, if you're interested in kind of playing a little bit of catch up and you don't have eight hours to dedicate to watching the videos <laughs> online, you can, use the, you can use the handouts to catch up. Um, and I am actually going to start with a little bit of a primer, um, a little bit of catch up for those of you that have been to Raise the Deschutes seminars. I, ha I am seeing a lot of familiar faces in the audience, but I'm curious how many people have attended a Raise the Deschutes seminar either in person or watched one online. Look at that. I'm so impressed. Thank you guys all for continuing to care and want to continue to learn more about what's going on in the basin. So I feel really lucky to have these two gentlemen sitting next to me today. Um, they are essentially, they've created this amazing case study and model um, that the rest of the basin is attempting to emulate. So we're going to, in this seminar, we're going to start kind of broad and explain the basin at large and kind of what some of the issues are. And then we're going to zoom in on what um, Mark and Ty and the Three Sisters Irrigation District has accomplished. And then we're going to kind of zoom back out to some of the work that we're working on currently um, with our partners, uh, NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, using, it's a mouthful, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. So I have to tell you, acronym SOUP is part of the job. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer to uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service as NRCS from here on out. And I'm going to refer to the Regional Conservation Partnership Program as the RCPP. <laughs> So disclaimer that those are probably going to come out of my mouth regularly or multiple times, and now hopefully you all know what they mean. Okay, so getting started here. Um, oh, um, should we play it now? You guys want to start with a little story? Let's start with the Baichu's Creek story featuring these two gentlemen. Waichu's today is coming alive. We were able to restore the stream and bring more water to the farmers and bring back the steelhead and the salmon and create an economic generator. Everyone all the way around wins. People should know, when they look at the streams, they see the water flowing, it always wasn't that way. Waichu's Creek in town was dry during the summer and that was the norm. When I first started as manager, a 70 year old farmer walked in and said, if that stream's not dry, then you're not doing your job. Many people had written White Juice Creek off. They didn't see it as a viable stream. They didn't imagine that there could be salmon and steelhead swimming in its waters. I approached the Deschutes River Conservancy to discuss how we would go about restoring White Juice Creek. So since 2010, the Deschutes River Conservancy's wor been working with the Three Sisters Irrigation District to pipe its main canal. Um, and that way, all the water that needs to get to the farm gets there, and water that's typically lost to the soil can be left in stream. We did this over nine phases, and we just completed the ninth phase this year. We have a total of 30 CFS in stream, contributing much needed flow to a creek that once went dry. Why Choose Today is a much livelier place. Not only the flow is restored, but the riparian area that surrounds the creek is coming back to life. And that's habitat for young trout and salmon. When you have the farmers and the water users benefiting and the community benefiting, it's a win-win situation. It should be an example for every irrigation district in the state. Oregon water belongs to everybody. We've got to learn to share that water. And White Shoes Creek is a huge part of the future of this community now. It's a thriving stream, it brings people together, children are playing in it, students are studying it, recreationists are hiking its banks and fishing, and it's a completely re-enlivened place. to have the stars of that video sitting next to me on the stage tonight. Um, okay, thank you, Matt.
All right. So this first slide is going to look really familiar to everybody, I think, at this point. But this is the Deschutes Basin. Um, it is the second largest river basin in Oregon. Who's, who knows the first? The Willamette. Yep, the Willamette is the largest. Um, the headwaters of the Deschutes uh, are up. Technically, they're Little Lava Lake. But really, the headwaters of the Deschutes are the Cascade Range, and all that water that falls into the Cascade, drain, Cascade Range and seeps into the very porous geology um, and feeds our river. And of course, fun fact, our river, like the Willamette, runs from south to north. <laughs> so um, that's the Deschutes Basin. Um, here is one of my favorite of all time maps that shows all of the surface water in the state of Oregon. Every stream, every lake, et cetera. What do you all notice about central Oregon? <laughs> Pretty dry place. Not a lot of surface water, OK? And that is because, again, we have that super porous volcanic geology. So everything that falls as rain and snow in this basin pretty much almost instantly percolates into the ground and becomes groundwater, right? So instead of like having the, the typical, you know, uh, snow accumulating in the mountains and then you get a warm up and all that water rushes into streams and creeks and starts filling rivers, that's not at all what happens here. It all goes pretty much straight into the ground, which accounts for this basically dark spot in the middle of this map. And also is a really good reason why canals um, don't make a ton of sense and why pipes are, are a good tool in this basin. So we'll get to that in just a minute. But again, something familiar to most of you at this point, this is a hydrograph of the Deschutes River. Um, and it shows flow on the x-axis, y-axis, I always get them confused, <laughs> flow over time, <laughs> basically. Um, and the Deschutes River, because of that geology and because of all of the groundwater, the Deschutes River is one of the most stable flowing rivers, naturally speaking, in the world. Because all of the river is basically fed from groundwater that is being pumped into the river via stream, or sorry, springs. So that is why we have, naturally speaking, a really stable hydrology. So again, another familiar um, map to a lot of you. Uh, so again, this is the Deschutes Basin, at least the upper and middle Deschutes Basin. So you can see the headwaters of Little Lava Lake, if I can get my little thing to work here. So Little Lava here. Um, and then all of the blobs, the colored blobs, represent the different irrigation districts in Central Oregon. And there are eight of them. And um, Little important thing to note about water rights. When people were settling this area, I should say resettling, when non-tribal folks were resettling um, Central Oregon, they were basically drawn here um, and encouraged to make the land productive by taking the water out of the streams and spreading it on the landscape so that they could gr grow crops. I mean, that was essentially what drove all the, the resettlement of this region. And in that process, um, water rights were given out. And those water rights were given out kind of on a first come, first serve basis. So each of the blo colored blobs on the map represent different areas that settled at different times and got a different priority rate or priority date associated with their water right. So the oldest priority dates are kind of closer to the urban centers, right? So the area in, um, the area in, Let's see, close to Bend, whoops, in this general area and this green area have pretty senior rights compared to that pinkish blob up north. Um, that pink blob is North Unit Irrigation District and they have a water right that dates to 1913. And I know to all of us in this room, 1913 sounds like a really long time ago, but actually in the grand scheme of the settlement of the Deschutes Basin, that was really late in time. By the time 1913 rolled around, all of the water in the Deschutes Basin had already been given out in water rights to the other districts. So there was no more water to give out. And so in order to meet the needs of that large area up in the north, in the Madras area, they needed to store water. That was how, that's how they met the needs of that district. So that is how Wikiup and Crane Prairie Ooh, all, whoops, this thing is hard to use. <laughs> all the way down here, 
um, were developed into reservoirs to serve North Unit Irrigation District. And so what that means is that in order to serve North Unit Irrigation District, they store water in the wintertime and they release water in the summertime. And effectively, that means the Deschutes River from below Wikiup north to Bend gets treated a lot like an irrigation ditch. Um, and then water is, to be able to get water all the way to Ma the Madras area using gravity, they actually hand dug canals from Bend so that they could travel and be gravity fed all the way from the city of Bend all the way up to Madras. So that is the canal system that we have in place right now and are still using today. Um, and many people often say, well, why didn't they keep the, the water in the river all the way to Lake Billy Chinook? It makes sense, except for there's a huge canyon and trying to get the water from the bottom of the canyon up out of the canyon to irrigate the lands wasn't feasible in 1913. So that is how we ended up with the situation that we're in today um, with a lot of the lands in this area being irrigated and a, as a result, a drastically altered hydrograph. So the green line on this, on this graph now shows kind of what is going on with the river today when we're storing water in the wintertime and the flows come down and then we're releasing water in the summertime. So this is, this is what we're dealing with. Um, and as a result of those priority dates and of water rights distribution system, um, this is how water in the Deschutes Basin is distributed, right? We have about 86% of the water rights are going to farm um, and for agriculture, 2% for municipal needs, and that 12% is water that we have through projects like the one we're gonna talk about tonight, we've managed to move in stream and protect permanently to keep that water in the river. Because fun fact, when they developed the water rights system in the early 1900s, um, it wasn't actually legal to leave water in stream. It wasn't considered a beneficial use. Like it was literally the imperative was to dry up the stream like Mark said in that video. So, um, so that's what, how we get, got here tonight and why we're talking about this particular tool. So we can and should all, you know, convert our lawns to zero scapes and take shorter showers and buy high efficiency, <laughs> you know, appliances. But at the end of the day, the big opportunities for us to conserve water and actually put water back in stream and meet the needs of growing cities and communities lies in that 86% of the pie. Okay. So um, when the Deschutes River Conservancy was formed in the mid 90s and when Mark was taking over Three Sisters Irrigation District as the manager, um, as we said in the video, Wychus Creek was running dry two out of every three years. The Deschutes River, like more than 98% of the flows were being diverted in Bend, leaving literally a trickle, if even that. And the Crooked River was also being extensively diverted. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of water at Smith Rock. So that was sort of the, the lay of the land. And the DRC was formed um, with the tribe's environmental interests and irrigation interests. And Mark got to work pretty fast and furiously at Three Sisters um, to put together tools like the one we're going to talk about tonight and to change that dynamic. So um, we're going to get into what irrigation modernization means and everything, but piping. Um, there are 700 miles of canals in central Oregon. That's a lot of canals dug in porous volcanic geology. And theoretically, also a lot of surf, we're attempting to create a lot of surface water in that area, that dark spot on the map. Um, and those canals are leaking about 50% of their water, which means that in order to reach a farm like Ty's Farm, and get water to where the farmers need it, they're having to divert twice as much water at the river to reach the farm. So um, this is just a fun little schematic that basically says exactly that. All right, and so pipes save water, um, allow us to permanently protect things, protect that water in the river, and also create opportunities for hydropower, which we're gonna talk more about. These guys are gonna talk more about. So, um, that's the big picture. Now we're gonna zoom in on the Wychus Creek story. Um, the red area on the map is Wychus Creek, and that is where these two gentlemen um, hail from. <laughs> and um, they're, yeah, so they're gonna tell, 
tell the story of Why Choose Creek. So two out of three years, no water in the stream. I think there were six fish passage barriers, meaning that every time a fish, if there were a fish that wanted to try to come up or downstream, they had to navigate six of these. Yep. Um, fish screening. Three Sisters Irrigation District had a diversion and were diverting water out to properties like Ties. And this is, this is an example of an old diversion. No screening whatsoever. So if you're a fish and you're swimming and you're not sure which way's the river and which way's the canal, you could very easily get stuck and end up on someone's farm, which is not what, what was needed. And then Wychus Creek was also heavily diked um, and straightened. They took all of the, the bends and things out of the, removed it from the floodplain entirely um, in an effort, really, and back in the day, that was, we were thinking that was the best thing to do, you know, to prevent, to, to prevent flooding. Um, so that is the lay of the land. So Mark, tell me what life was like um, when you came into the district in 1997. 1988. Can I? Uh, oh, it's good. It. <laughs> so um, I bought 400 acres with 200 irrigated acres in 1988. And um, there weren't any real jobs in Central Oregon, so I figured how hard could farming be. Um, and I, I learned quickly how hard farming could be. It's a good way to burn money. Um, but the first thing that I realized is they would deliver my water to my ranch over my weir, and they'd put four CFS over that weir, and only three would get to my pond that I pumped out of. And I thought, well, good Lord, I've got a mile-long private ditch, and I'm losing a whole CFS. That's a real waste. And then when we went to 50% water, and they only put two CFS over that, now only I, I only had one CFS in my pond. And that was one of the reasons I was one of the lucky few who had a 150-horse uh, groundwater well that pumped 1,150 gallons a minute. So I was able to survive. And back in those days, electricity was one cent a kilowatt, 1.1. 1 .1. And now it's about eight. So. Uh, the $10,000 electric bill immediately went to 90000 was So it was, uh, it was a real learning experience. So for 10 years, I volunteered at the irrigation district because they were basically broke and didn't have any money and didn't have staff. Uh, they didn't even have a restroom. They had an outhouse. Um, and that was always entertaining as a volunteer. Uh, eventually, I demanded a porta potty, which they succumbed to figuring <laughs> the thousands of hours uh, we were putting in. But the first thing I did as a volunteer is I remapped the whole district. So I got to meet all of the farmers. And back when I came, there were 80 farms. And now there's 200 farms in Three Sisters Irrigation District. And so when I got to the, the district, um, they were having a tough time finding a manager. and. In some ways, I volunteered because I said I'd do it for what they were paying, which is, was not much more than what they were paying ditch riders at other irrigation districts. But I said I would continue to farm. And the first year, uh, I found a hole in one of our dams in the Rereg Reservoir. And my board president turned to me and said, oh, this is simple. We'll just build it in-house. And I said, I don't know anything about building dams. He says, it's no problem. I've built two. It's going to be easy, trust me. That was the first mistake. The second was depending on farm volunteers because they're good when they're available. But um, we didn't have any equipment at the time. And I looked at the problem. I realized that we were losing 55% of our water in seepage. And I just said to the board of directors, I said, this has got to change. And I was really lucky, I mean, and I've been lucky for 34 years, so um, and just this was the start of the luck. And I walked into the ASCS and uh, SCS office uh, at the time in, I want to say Prineville. Well, you tell us what that stands for. Oh, sorry. The acronym for So but over before here. they became NRCS, they were the um, Agricultural ASCS. Soil. Soil and Conservation Service. And then SCS was their technical arm, was their engineering arm. Um, so I don't know. 
I, I, it's a long, that's a long time ago. <laughs> and it just so happened there was a special equip grant that had been given to what at the time we were Squaw Creek Irrigation District, and it was, uh, it was not Wychus yet, it was Squaw Creek. And they had been given this money, and no one had signed up for the money, and it was on the third year, and the money was about to expire. And so I went and visited with some of the farmers who were flood irrigators, and I said, hey, you know, you guys get water one day a week right now. How'd you like to get water seven days a week? And they're like, well, is that possible? I said, well, most of the district that's pumping is getting water seven days a week. So I signed up. I got three pipelines set up for the district, um, and I learned how to then write a equip cooperative agreement uh, a pooled le kind of a pooled agreement for all the farmers on the ditch. And we did three of those, and then uh, I think there was a little bit of money left over that went down in a lower bridge and did some piping uh, between pivots. But that's how we got started. And all of a sudden, these farmers, for the first time ever, were able to really irrigate their ground. Because one thing about flood irrigation that was I always loved, they would deliver the first person at the head of the ditch, and then they would move to the next person the next day. And miraculously, a rock or a pine cone would somehow get under the first head gate. And by the time they got to the <laughs> fifth person at the end of the ditch, there was no water because there were five rocks or five pine cones underneath <laughs> the upstream head gates. And of course, that person would then walk up, shut all the head gates, scream at all their neighbors, come to the board meeting, scream <laughs> at the board. Um, and so it made me realize that this needed to be fixed. And these folks were the first demonstration. Um, and we ended up doing 10 of those uh, kind of pooled equip uh, contracts before we delved in with the DRC with the Cloverdale. And so I won't, I won't keep going, but no, I no. Just, that yeah. just kind of gives you the snapshot. You know, I had a backhoe, I had a three yard dump truck, uh, I had a pickup that you had to lift the shift, shifter up to shift and you could see through the floor on the passenger side, so that was always entertaining. I had a ditch rider who had a ZZ Top beard and a 45 by his side, and if he wasn't liquored up by noon, it was a bad day for him. <laughs> so um, it was Wild West, no bathroom, uh, oil stove, uh, you know, it just no running water in the office. I was like, it just can't get any better than this. <laughs> So we, we jumped into this and, you know, NRCS was our first major partner and they really, um, they really showed me the possibilities of, of what could be done. And then the advent of the DRC and the in-stream conserve water, uh, all of these things happened all at the right time. And my farmers were only, I always explain this to them, I'm diverting a cup of water and you're getting less than half a cup. And they're like, well, I want more water. I said, well, that's why we're going to put in a pipe so you can have more water. Because there was no more water in the stream to there, be had. No more water, <laughs> so there was no more no water, water in the stream because we, we dried it up. Yep, exactly. Every summer. Yeah. Ty, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience? I know you arrived even prior to Mark. Yeah, here. Yeah, I bought my property in 1973, and our house and the farmstead of the acreage sat. Oops. Here. I think maybe just hold a little bit closer sat, to your mouth. Sat um, pretty close to the canal, so it was uh, a very aesthetic setting, and that's one of the reasons that um, I bought that particular piece of property. And and. Um, uh, those days, um, the water, there weren't many flooders, uh, I'd say, in the upper district. There were probably four or five flooders that had 100 acres or more. And we'd have to rotate through the week to get our allocation. And the problem with flooding is you have to he have a huge head of water to push it across your fields. My fields were 200 feet wide by 700 feet long, and they were almost like rice paddies. So it was a good flooding system, but it still took a huge head of water. And that 
would give me two or three days a week at the most to irrigate. And when we'd start getting 77, we had an extremely dry year. I remember February, middle of February, there was 23 inches of snow on Mount Bachelor. And a normal summer through the end of July, I would get two to three days, 72 hours at 100% delivery for my water. That summer, I had one day where I got 24, I got 24 hours of water delivered that whole summer. That was the most I had the whole summer. I think I irrigated 18 acres out of the 160, and that was, that was it. So we knew, we knew we had a problem flooding. People were jamming um, tarps under the weirs to block off any leakage through the system. The system hadn't been improved at all. Each outlet for the private ditches, they all leaked. Um, it was just a pretty much a nightmare, and that doesn't even count the loss in the ditch itself. That was just getting the water on farm. And um, uh, when the piping project came up, um, I was a little reluctant to lose the canal because it was right in our backyard, and it was going to be gone, and it was going to be in a pipe, and the pipe was going to be buried, and I had a lot of old trees that had been dependent on that water, like anyone who would live on an unlined canal. And, uh, you know, Mark would say, I'd call him, well, you got five more years, Ty, and okay. <laughs> and four more years, okay. All of a sudden, time's up. <laughs> and um, we, we were able to go around a little section of the canal right behind the house and pipe the uh, ground just to the be just to the north of the original canal, so we were able to leave a little section of the canal, which was nice for uh, for our little nostalgia, and um, it it's uh, at that point we worked with NRCS and were able to uh, engineer a three pivot project for the farm, and I wouldn't have to flood irrigate anymore, which uh, made a huge difference. Now, in our white juice system, about usually by, at least by the end of July, we'd be down to 50% water. When I would flood irrigate, I could do maybe 20 acres of that property because of the lack of, of water. And with the new system, with the pivots, at 50% water, I can water 130 acres. So the difference is unbelievable. And because of that short water in the, in the uh, end of the summer, I could never get my land fully producing because I knew I'd be having to cut way back by July. So I, you know, I could do 80 acres or 60 acres or, you know, whatever, whatever I thought would, would work for that particular water season. And now, of course, I can do the whole property and it's, um, it's tripled my production. And um, the beautiful thing about our system is we're all on pressurized water. So Mark mentioned earlier some of the costs of electricity that all the uh, White Shoes Creek irrigators had to use. Now we virtually have free electricity. The, the system works through the pressurized water. In fact, we had to actually regulate the water down to run our pivots because they should run at 50 psi, and we had some of our some of our pipes had 120 psi running through them, but which it, it was easy enough to do, but... Uh, so I'm going to break that down for, for some of the folks in the audience who, a, may, who may not understand the PSI and the pressurized water and the benefits of that. But 
we'll, we'll take an, this is, uh, these photos as an example. So on the left-hand side um, is a property that's being flood irrigated. And that whole area that's kind of a, a brownish tan is the area that they are attempting to get water to. But when you're dealing with a system like the ones that Ty and Mark are, have sort of explained, you know, you're basically, you have a ditch with this giant slug of water coming down in a really short amount of time, and you're trying to move it across a big piece of property, quite frankly, using tarps in a lot of cases to kind of like dam up the ditch and move stuff around. Um, and you often end up with sort of a growth, um, you, you end up with something that looks like the left picture, um, where you've got some green areas and then you've got some brown areas where the water just didn't get there, or maybe there's a high spot, a pile of rocks or something. I mean, these properties aren't totally level. But when you put a sprinkler on um, a system like this, you get much more, e you know, even productive <laughs> pastures and crops. So that's what you're dealing with on the right. And in a lot of cases, you're using a lot less water with what you're seeing on the right than what you're, what you're using on the left. You're using much less water and you can control the amount of water that you're putting on the ground. Flooding was always, the, the, the difficult thing about it was the closest to the outlet, you know, that, it took, it, it got all the water and by the time you get clear to the end of the 700 feet, you know, you would just, you just go out there and it's just it's just barely moving and then you get there and it's it's <laughs> done and, and it but it never really got saturated enough because you wanted to move the water down to the next set and and so your your production was um, the stands stay a lot longer the stands of whatever you're planting whether it's uh, alfalfa or uh, orchard grass they maintain their um, ability to produce much longer because of the even distribution of water. Yeah. You, the very front of the ditches would tend to, um, you know, they get more weeds and, and other problems, and, and um, it's it's just it's unbelievable the difference in the and and the l lack of you just use so much less water in, in the distribution. Yeah. And the, the systems are designed, the nozzles give out, as the system extends out over the field, the nozzles. nozzles give a lot less water uh, out, and on and on it goes. Yeah. So I also just want to bring in the energy piece a little bit, too, because, um, you know, when you have the flood irrigated system, the energy is... Ty and Mark in the field and the farmers running around moving the water at three o'clock in the morning sometimes. <laughs> I think Ty told me he moved his water like every three to four hours. Every three to four hours. So the man is yeah. setting an alarm clock and running around the farm and that is the energy for flood irrigating. But when you move to a more sophisticated system like a pivot, oops, sorry, I'm going backwards. Sorry, everybody. Um, when you use a pivot, um, these systems do take electricity, right? So if you have a farm and you've been flood irrigating, um, chances are you're taking your water right out of the ditch and moving it across the farm during the time when you're getting your water delivered. If you have a sprinkler system, you're gonna need to pressurize that water using energy. And you're gonna need to store your water in a pond to be able to pump that water and pressurize that water. Um, but what Mark and Ty have been alluding to is that in the process of modernizing the Three Sisters Irrigation District, because of the topography of that district and piping from the diversion at the river all the way out to the farm, putting that water in pipes basically um, generated enough pressure for Ty to be able to run his pivots off of the pressure in those pipes, meaning he didn't need an individual pump. And all those farmers that had already converted to sprinklers and were using ponds and pumps were able to take those pumps offline. And they were able to use the pressure that was in those pipes. So that is a huge benefit of modernization that is often overlooked when we start talking about like, oh, we're saving water. Yeah, we're saving water. But there's also a huge energy um, savings component to these projects. Um, and in the case of Mark and Ty, there is also a huge energy generation component. 
So um, on the energy front, so the three hydros uh, that we've built are going to be generating about probably four, four and a half million kilowatt hours of green energy that will be sold to Pacificor. And then uh, they reduce their coal generation to conform with the Oregon Renewable Portfolio Standard. So as a result, our projects help burn, make less coal uh, burning in uh, by pack, and then uh, in turn they're able to buy our green energy for the next 20 years till we then renegotiate a new contract. Um, but the real carrot for the farmers is we eliminated eliminated nine million kilowatt hours of pumping cost, which right now is about seven hundred thousand dollars a year. As a result of that, the farmers have been spending over $2 million a year in the local economy, buying tractors, buying new farm equipment, switching to seed crops, adding pivots, building farm buildings. Uh, and I'm just here to tell you, it's, it's just amazing what we've seen, uh, the kind of investment, because they eliminated their electric bill. And they, in addition to eliminating your electric bill, you eliminate, if you've ever been hit by lightning and watched your pump fry, and then you know, have to go find a way to pump water uh, till they get you a new pump in a month. Um, it's it's very, very, very discouraging. And w one of the reasons I didn't want to switch over earlier was because of the energy costs. And, and now, literally, it's about $400 for the whole irrigation season for me to operate my three pivots. <laughs> and that's simply to run the tire, the wheels, to move the they have a little half horse motors on them and it's it's just it's really quite remarkable i also oh. let me just throw this in real quick so to also to give you some historical uh facts on the water usage uh because three sisters was formed in 1891 and we have 1895 water rights we're pretty much the oldest district um in uh central oregon we don't have a duty we just have a rate and um, that, as a result, and we don't have an irrigation season. So when, before uh, the farmers started installing pumps and hand line in the 60s, and then eventually wheel lines in the 70s, the whole district was flood irrigated. And so we used to irrigate 10, 11, 12 months out of the year. If, it, if, it, if we were able to get past the ice in the forest and the creek, the farmers were soaking up their ground so that they'd have a profile full of water come start of the growing season. And we used to divert 50,000 acre feet a year. And I went back and looked at between, you know, because our records go back over 100 years, uh, which is amazing about the Deschutes Basin. And I was looking at years where we were diverting 50,000 acre feet and irrigating not always 12 months out of the year, but close. When we went to Sprinkler, we went to between 35, 37,000 acre feet. And now with the piping, we're diverting about 27 to 28,000 acre feet. Um, and my farmers have 25% more water, and the stream has a protected flow of 34 CFS in it. So it really works. Um, last year was a horrible drought. Anyone from Arnold remembers the water being turned off July 23rd, the earliest ever. We were at 100% water all the way into August, 70% water through August, and then 50% water uh, in September and October. So And the creek had water in and it. And the creek had water all the year long. whole time. And, um, you know, 1977, which I like to compare everything to because it was brutal, we delivered 10% water the whole year to our farmers, um, Glenn Cooper raised 50 ton of hay on 300 acres. And um, you can't do anything with 10% water. It just, just, it just disappears. Especially if you were flooding because it, you'd have, it'd be gone. Couldn't even get across the first field. Yeah. So it, 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 it truly does work. And um, we've now piped 60, uh, two of the 65 miles, and we're in the process of finishing up with, uh, I guess, our second RCPP uh, with NRCS to finish the last three miles of private laterals. And um, I'm really excited because it has meant the world to the farmers, 
but it's also meant the world of the fish. And so uh, if it's good for the whole community, uh, it's something I like pushing hard on. All right, I'm just gonna show some quick photos since we have them up here to kind of help help everybody understand what, what folks are dealing with out there. Um, so these are from your district. Um, these are old, old infrastructure. You wanna tell us what we're looking at? So on the left, you've got the 1920 log crib dam, which got washed out um, uh, almost, I wanna say immediately, um, 21. <laughs> um, and they just kind of left it. And then what happened uh, re kind of recently uh, before we put in the fish screen and the passage in 2010 and 11 uh, is uh, when White goes to 2000 CFS, it shoots 60 foot ponderosas down like toothpicks. And so you're looking at a log jam up, which um, I'll tell a good story because I can't get in trouble. I think the statute of limitations has expired. <laughs> so I, I, the, my federal partners are always really good because they give me good advice on how to get around the state. And so I rented an excavator and I was on top of that pile because we were afraid it was gonna wash out the bank and stuff because it had gone around the log crib dam. And so I was actually pulling logs off and setting them aside so they could use them in stream restoration later. And I called DSL and said, I need an emergency permit. And she said, well, we'll get to that on Monday. I said, oh, don't worry, I'm out here right now. So if you could just <laughs> process it, um, I'll just get this finished up. And I was done that day. And the hazard was removed. Um, and everybody signed off on it, um, sort of. <laughs> um, but uh, on the right is uh, after the 64 uh, Christmas Day flood, uh, it really trashed our um, wooden diversion that was farther downstream. And so we built this concrete dam in 1970. And it did have fish passage. It's just, you know, fish trying to go through a tunnel with boulders flying at them because uh, it's a very alluvial stream. It, it didn't work so well. Um, Which and, is the story with a lot of passage on and, a lot of early infrastructure. And what we did, and, and I have to tell you, my hat's off to um, all the conservation groups, the, the state, the, the, the feds. Um, they all worked with us because they wanted to build a million dollar fish ladder. I'm like, guys, it's just gonna fill up with gravel. I said, what if we bury the dam? And they said, well, that's gonna take a lot of material. I said, did you notice that I'm digging? <laughs> putting in two 54-inch side-by-side pipes and digging a 50-foot-wide trench <laughs> that is 10 feet deep. I said, how many tens of thousands of yards you need? We'll bring them to you. So everybody agreed, and they then did the design, and we buried the dam. So the fish just to get, swim right over the dam as opposed to having to maintain a fish ladder which would have been an absolute nightmare. This is one of the flashiest creeks, not as bad as the hood, but close to it. And um, we, used to, we used to migrate through our canal every year, 3,000 cubic yards of sand and gravel that would go four miles to a sand trap in our re-reg reservoir down at Watson Reservoir. And then I'd dig that material out and we'd actually use it to bed pipes. But all that material returns instantaneously to the stream through the fish screen right now so that there's no gravel deep, you know, depletion at all. So there fish screens be, yeah. are wonderful. I'm not a big fan of fish ladders. <laughs> I'm a big fan of reconstructing the stream. And my hat's off to the Watershed Council who basically, uh, as well as the Forest Service who basically GC'd this product, project, and they planted almost 50,000 plants, and um, one of the farmers turned them in for not getting a water right uh, to irrigate those plants. <laughs> so I gave them a industrial right so they could water their plants. They had a 95% take. And uh, the funny part is the plants that they fenced off to keep away from the deer and the elk did worse than the ones that got browsed. So the fence is out of there, and the riparian habitat is just amazing in that 1,200 feet down below. Uh, the diversion dam, uh, and the work they did was fabulous. But burying that was, uh, I, I told the biologist to quit counting after 3,000 yards. We ended up bringing them <laughs> between 30 and 40,000 cubic yards of material to do that channel restoration. 
Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go through these relatively quickly. This is also old infrastructure. I, I it is the same dam. I want Ty really quickly to just tell us if you can tell us briefly about the mailbox, because this is a water delivery on a farm with a mailbox, and it is not a U.S. Postal Service mailbox, but it does serve a purpose. And Ty, can you tell, <laughs> tell me about this? very reminiscent of what our system was like through the, well, through the 70s, 80s, and, and 90s. Um, the area to the right next to the mailbox is where you lift up for your private lateral and at the time you would do that you would put a little note in the mailbox and say I turned on at 10 a.m. and I'm going to run a eight head over a P2 weir and that was information for the ditch rider and uh, when water was delivered we, we delivered by the acre foot in on our, our system in Wychus. And according to the size of the head, you get so many hours. So that's why you'd write 10 a.m. in that mailbox, and then you know that you were you had, at whatever percent that week was, you would have so many hours to run that size of head, and then you'd write in your note when you turned off the water, you'd put it in that mailbox, and uh, you know, once in a while you'd leave some cookies or <laughs> something, uh, you know, at the end of the summer, something special. But these so, mailboxes were all over the district, and and um, they were, uh, I don't know what Mark did with all of them. So. Well, the, 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 the ditch riders also had to then leave the yellow s copy slips because we were... Basically, our water slips had multiple copies on them. And so each week, they had to leave the yellow slips with the farmer. And then the farmer had two weeks to dispute the readings. Now, they never did that. They waited until the end of the year. And we had a board of equalization, which we still do. But we just don't get anyone showing up anymore. But it was a very entertaining system. My guys used to spend hours each day filling out those books for each weir. It took two ditch riders. Eight to 12 hours, seven days a week to run water. And now with a pipe system, it takes one guy two to four hours. Yeah, they had, so, to, they had to measure each weir with a measuring stick and then go up to the mailbox and leave a note. So those are... Clean the weeds. These are the old days for the Three Sisters Irrigation District now. But in reality, these are still very much techniques that are used across the basin in many of the 700 miles of... of unpiped, so open canals that still exist in the Deschutes. And I don't think they have a mailbox system necessarily. Each district does things a little bit differently. Sure. But the point is that the, this technology is still very much alive and well throughout Central Oregon. And that's where a lot of that 86% of our water in that pie chart, that's where it's going. So I'm just going to quickly run through some photos. Again, an, old, um, an older diversion. Um, this is a canal. This is what a canal looks like when it's empty. So again, going back to that super porous volcanic geology and think about the water loss in a canal. Um, this is a breach that was in the newspaper just last April, I believe. Um, a canal up near Redmond was breached and flooded a road and a homestead. Um, so a lot of sort of the issues that folks are dealing with. Here's a fun uh, photo of a sinkhole these often open up on canals um, on just any given day. And uh, you can imagine the volume of water that gets lost when that happens. Um, here is a, an, another sinkhole um, on a canal. Um, I feel like at this point in the presentation, this probably should have come earlier, but here's an overview of what we're talking about when we're talking about irrigation <laughs> modernization. So we are talking about piping canals and laterals. We're also talking about like what Ty just was talking about with uh, measurement. We're talking about improving measurement and monitoring and, and um, management. You know, you can manage your water when it's, when it's coming out of a pipe. Converting flood to irrigation um, or to sprinklers. Uh, and then there's also improving irrigation practices and soil moisture monitoring and selecting different crops. So those are all part of the puzzle in, in the irrigation modernization world. Um, okay, so some of the goals that we've achieved through, or that these guys, I shouldn't say we, this is before my time. 
this is this is we because this is the, this is the this is the what makes the DRC such a star, um, and why TSID and DRC were such great partners. Um, you know, basically, uh, the the partnership that started DRC were the seven irrigation districts, um, uh, the tribes, and and then Environmental Defense Fund, and um, it was an incredible concept. Uh, Senator Hatfield was kind enough to carry it. Um, uh, and to be honest, today, the Bureau of Reclamation's Conservation Partnership Water Smart Grants are modeled after the Deschutes River Conservancy. Um, Bob Graham, who was at NRCS back in um, late 1900s, in 19, like, 98 when I started meeting those folks becoming the manager um, and I was up there and I said Bob you, you know tell me your secret and he said Mark it's all about the partnership and I didn't let those words uh, go lightly and so here uh, we had the basically the Deschutes partnership which was the watershed council and the DRC and the land trust uh, and the Crooked River watershed council um, working with all of our partners, uh, the Pelton Fund, which is PG and the tribes, um, uh, and then National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, and what was, and as well as OWEB, what was so incredible about the DRC is they were writing five to six grants per year for TSID, and then I was out getting water smart money. Um, when we applied for the ERA money, which was the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in 2008, out of the 200 applications, we were the number one application in the West, in the country. And DRC was one of the few, um, Oregon got kind of short shifted on the money, but DRC got, I want to say, $4 million of ERA money. Washington got $80 million. Um, but that didn't matter. Um, we were scoring way up there, and so we had Water Smart, and then following um, right before that, the PL566 program had been closed to no new starts for like 15, 20 years. That's an NRCS and program. And so I, it's a, their watershed program, and so I begged Bob Graham to let me write a watershed plan, and finally he relented because the Soil and Water Conservation District in Deschutes applied, uh, was the sponsor. And so we started writing that plan in November of 2003, and the chief signed it in June of 2004. That record will never be broken again, because <laughs> it now takes two to three years to get a watershed plan done. But um, all of a sudden, because I had been told no new starts by appropriations, there was $300,000 left over from the PL566 project up at Trout Creek, and headquarters called up Bob Graham and said, hey, we've got money. Do you have any plans? And Bob just looked at him and thought, goddamn Thaliker, he's so lucky. <laughs> and he called me up. He says, you just got 300000 And all of a sudden, I had uh, Senator uh, Wyden and uh, Senator Smith and Greg Walden on the phone calling me and saying, hey, How'd you get an earmark without us? And I said, well, I don't know. Anyway, they helped me get two more earmarks after that. And um, that watershed plan was reviewed by, uh, during the BPA and Power Planning Council process. And that, we were the, we were the number one project in uh, our area, in the Deschutes Basin, in the Columbia Basin as far as the scoring. So it's all about these people together, working together, and in addition to this, there's probably 20 other partners as well. Yeah, there, this is not a comprehensive list, but essentially these are the objectives and, and that have been realized in the Three Sisters Irrigation District and Wychus Creek in terms of saving energy and water reducing the carbon footprint, um, you know, obviously being able to sustain agriculture, um, even in times of extreme, ex exceptional drought, the reintroduction of fish, which we had a seminar on a couple of months ago, um, and then restoring the stream. Um, so 
real quick on the hydro topic, and I know I could let you talk about this, but I'm not going to because it's in the interest of time. <laughs> we, we, need to, we need to keep rolling, but um, Mark has three hydro generating facilities in his district, and I do have to just, I wanna just make the point that these facilities are not facilities on the stream, right? So when we think about hydro generation, we often think about destroying rivers or altering rivers um, to be able to produce that energy. And that is not what is happening here. These are off, they're off channel. So they're basically um, built into Three Sisters Irrigation District's delivery system. So they're taking advantage of that pressurization and that power in the pipes and the gravity that is you know, from the diversion all the way to the farm and they're able to generate uh, renewable energy without harming any fish or any ecosystems. So that's a very important part of this, of this picture. Mark, just, Mark mentioned the drop from the diversion to Watson. How many feet is it? So that's 197 and then we've got 137 down to uh, the McKenzie Hydro and then there's 234 foot of drop down into uh, lower bridge and one of the things that she was showing that's our micro hydro demonstration project that was actually designed by NRCS and has three on farm turbines in there and eventually we're going to be doing over 60 on farm micro hydro net meter turbines in the district as soon as I get the county not asking to have a conditional use permit for the farmer and I get the state not asking to have a duplicative water right because we already have hydro supplemental water rights on all the water in the district. So two minor things. <laughs> Hi, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so getting back to um, also this was all accomplished um, with great impacts uh, for, for the environment. I mean, Waichu's Creek now has water in it all the time, year round, somewhere between at least 23 and 45 CFS, which I know might not mean much to all of you, but know that it's a lot more water than no water. So <laughs> it no longer goes dry. Um, they've also protected and um, done a lot of land, the uh, Deschutes Land Trust has done a lot of conservation easements and um, acquired land and preserved, there are several preserves up there. Um, all six of those fish passage barriers have been removed, which opens up Waichu's Creek for those reintroduced salmon and steelhead um, that are now passing the Pelton Round Butte facility for the first time in 60 some odd years. Um, and yeah, there's four and a half miles of stream that in 385 acres of high quality habitat that's been restored. And there's a little picture, the pictures of kind of what has happened. That top picture shows um, when that floodplain had been sort of, or the creek had been removed from the floodplain. And then they kind of, they re-engineered it and brought it back to um, its former glory. So um, there's a beautiful picture of Waichu's Creek. Uh, before we wrap up, um, there are a few things, there are a few myths that I would like to try to dispel somewhat. They're not entirely myths, but um, a lot of people get very sort of upset about piping for a couple of reasons that I don't want to, I would be remiss if I didn't at least acknowledge those reasons. So, um, oh, wait, before, <laughs> sorry. Um, let me back up, excuse me. The Regional Partnership, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, the RCPP program that NRCS um, is the funder of, is responsible for not only a lot of the great work that has happened in the Three Sisters Irrigation District, but they are continuing to fund a lot of the large scale piping projects, at least in part, across the Deschutes Basin. I wanna say at this point, there's been about 150, $75 million that's come into the Deschutes Basin, somewhere along those lines, um, for large-scale piping projects. And the Regional Conservation Partnership Program that we're working on right now is actually helping to sort of connect the farmers, like Ty, to those large-scale pipes. So we have another program um, right now that we're working on in the Smith Rock Kingway geography. That's a little um, red bl blob on the map there. Um, where we are piping laterals and doing companion on-farm projects. So we're basically using the model that these guys have created and trying to do that very same thing in other areas of the Deschutes Basin, and that is with the support of NRCS. Um, oops, and I'm going the wrong way, my gosh. Okay, as you all know, um, the upper Deschutes River is dewatered at certain times of the year. Um, well, the upper and the middle Deschutes River are dewatered at certain times of the year 
because of the storage and release of water for irrigation. We already talked about that. So here's some photos of what that looks like. Um, the upper left photo is the middle Deschutes River and the other two are the upper Deschutes River just below Wikiup in the winter months. So that is the problem that that um, RCPP and the Smith Rock Kingway geography is working on trying to fix right now. And I can clicker problems today. Now we're back to the myths. Sorry, everybody, for my um, out of order slides. So wildlife, piping and wildlife. Um, a lot of folks, I hear this all the time, are super concerned about the impacts of taking away the canals and how that is gonna impact local wildlife. Um, and so I pulled a couple quotes, this quote basically from an article that came out with um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife essentially talking about there being real risks to wildlife of some of those larger canals. Um, they're constantly, I think, unfortunately, in some of the areas where there's lining or concrete, pulling carcasses out of canals um, of wildlife that have fallen into those canals. Um, and then going back to that stream map that I showed you of the state of Oregon at the beginning of the presentation, you know, not that long ago by, um, you know, the, the, in the general scheme of things, um, there wasn't a lot of surface water in this area and populations of deer and elk and other wildlife were thriving on the natural water bodies that, that were here. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because I know a lot of people um, are really concerned of getting rid of the canals, um, but we will still have ponds and we will still have irrigated agriculture and there will still be, hopefully, a thriving Deschutes River. Um, another thing that people are really concerned about is um, wells. Wells going dry around um, the region and that is very much a reality for a lot of people. Um, the science thus far shows that um, the vast majority of, of wells sort of, or the groundwater um, system basically deepening, I should say, I'm having a hard time with words right now, um, is, is a climate, climate driven. Um, if you look at precipitation across the basin over the last 100 years, um, there's a slow downward trend and we're seeing that um, reflected in the aquifer. And we're also seeing, um, I mean, pumping. Pumping is, is also a real factor. And canals are not, um, they are also a factor, but they are a smaller factor, relatively speaking, um, compared to climate. So with that, I also have one more slide um, from our groundwater talk. Uh, all the water that seeps into the ground, we, are, we already sort of talked about this, um, is, is headed towards the Deschutes River. It's just a question of where it is going to enter the Deschutes River, right? So in, in our case, all the water we're diverting to farms that are seeping into the porous geology, all that water from canals, it's making its way back to the Deschutes River. It's just making its way back to the Deschutes River down sort of around Lake Billy Chinook where stream flows are not as much of an issue, or not an issue. Um, meanwhile, on the upper Deschutes River, we have a river that is in desperate need of water in the winter months, and then the middle Deschutes River, just below Bend, we have a river that's in desperate need of water in the summer months. So the water is staying in the system, so to speak, um, but it is, not in, it is not in the natural water body the way that it existed before we came and, and started changing the system. So with that, um, yeah, irrigation modernization is a pretty critical tool in our toolbox for helping to restore flows to rivers and streams while also helping farmers get the water that they need to grow crops. It's also obviously helping irrigation districts with management. And another point I really wanna make, um, and we've talked about this in other seminars, is there's a whole suite of other tools that we're using to try to get water where it's needed. And that's, we kind of put that in the water marketing bucket. Um, so we're trying to incentivize people who don't need water to, to move their water to folks who do need water or to move water into the streams. We have an in-stream leasing program that has been, um, been robust since the, since the beginning of the DRC. And that allows you know, farmers and other landowners who are not using their water to lease that water back in stream. But when you're diverting water through those super porous you know, canals, out to farms that are you know, dozens of miles away from the river, it's not always operationally feasible for people to lease their water. If you've got somebody at the very end of a canal who needs his water, and you've got 10 people along the way on that canal, 
that want to lease their water to the river, that guy at the end of the canal is not going to be able to get his water. So oftentimes, people are sort of taking water that they don't need because of these antiquated systems. So again, when we're able to put things in pipes and we're able to measure and monitor that, we can manage the water better and that opens up a whole suite of opportunities for being able to move water from places where people really don't need it or don't need as much of it to places where it's really needed in the basin. So with that, I think we can take questions. Okay, got the mic up here. Down there. I'll start back here to some conveniently located <laughs> right next to this woman. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's very interesting and um, a lot of uh, good information uh, for me. Um, one question I have when I look at uh, the um, irrigation systems that are on the pivot irrigation versus flood is how much water is lost to evaporation. Versus the flood irrigation, I, you've painted a really good picture of its inefficiencies, but I do understand that that water that is lost to the river and lost to the, the actual field is at least going into the groundwater. I do appreciate your last bit where you said it's going into the groundwater, but it, it enters it, the, the chutes downstream, so that was good information for me. But what about the loss due to evaporation and um, why, um, why do the pivot systems operate during all hours of the day, uh, even during times of really high amount of evaporation? Uh, actually, there's very little loss now due to technology in the pivot. We have what are called drop lines, and they they sit. Um, in the old days, the pivots were set up. The sprinkler was actually on top of the pipe, mm -hmm. and the pipes would be eight to ten to twelve feet high, depending on the arch in that particular stretch of of pipe. Now, with the drop lines, you can set the water three, two, three feet above the crop. And there's very little evaporation because it's dropping directly onto the field. Plus, the nozzles are uh, <clears throat> giving out a, a bigger spray than they would have uh, in the old days because of the technology that how they've evolved. And so, the f the finer the spray, the greater the chance of blowing away and evaporating before contact with the ground. So I, it's very very little evaporation compared to what it was like. Yeah. And same with wheel lines, you always had a problem with evaporation as well. Yeah, so I'll say one of the first things I learned about those pivots is that the great improvement in the pivot world, and again, those are the big towers that we showed pictures of, um, is what, I always remember this because it's my name, is the LISA. It's the low elevation sprinkler application. So basically, just like Ty described, instead of applying water way up high where it gets blown around or potentially evaporates, they're moving those hoses lower to the ground um, and delivering the water more directly to the crops. Um, and they even have now what I've heard called, I like this one too, because it's just easy to remember, the mobile dragon line. It's not a dragon like the fire one, but dragging across the, the, the field. So they drop a line and then they drag the line as the pivot goes around in a circle. And again, they're delivering the water directly to the ground where the crop needs it and can use it. So those are some of the, again, those are the modernization pieces of the puzzle. And But you still do see a lot of people that have the higher elevation sprinklers. Those are out there. Um, there are used to be, and I'm gonna guess, hopefully there still is some incentives out there for folks to switch from those like mid elevation or high elevations to those LISA, the low elevation sprinkler applications, um, which helps reduce Reduce evaporation. And as far as um, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as 24-hour cycles, mm. the pivot is always putting out the same <clears throat> amount of water through the system. The amount you put down depends on the speed that the pivot is moving. So uh, because the same amount of water is always coming out of the out of the sprinkler system, so you you increase or decrease the amount of saturation 
by the speed of the actual pivot. So that's why you can set it up on a 24 hour or 48 hour cycle, depending on how much water you want to put down during that cycle of growth for whatever crop it is you're, you're growing. And that's the nice thing about a pivot, you can control the amount of water simply by doing that, and it's so precise. And you're irrigating during the day, correct me if I'm wrong, oh, yeah. because you need to to be able to get across all yeah, the ground. You're, you're I mean, irrigating. it's just such a large, it's like unlike us in our yard where we can choose, hey, I'm going to irrigate at 6 a.m. for an hour in my tiny little plot, and I'm going to give, you know, my, my, my plants what they need and be done with it. I mean, these guys are dealing with like hundreds of acres, and those pivots have to go all the way around. And so um, they don't have the choice really to effectively turn off at the at noon when the rest of us and I was one of these people as well who's driving around going like why is everybody irrigating in the heat of the day I don't understand but now that I understand how these systems work I much I have better understanding of why folks are needing to irrigate to be able to just basically cover like huge huge amounts of acres so really good questions so basically a pivot's 90 to 95 percent efficient uh, wheel lines about 70 percent unless the wind blows and then the efficiency can go down on that. Uh, when we were delivering water to uh, Ty, he'd run sometimes 10 second feet over the P2 and another three to four uh, second feet over uh, the C3. And so we were basically giving him uh, who roughly like eight, maybe 8,000 gallons. And now he's able to run all three pivots and his corners was 1,700 gallons a minute. So that's roughly a little more, a little more than uh, three CFS. So you you can imagine. Fifth, fifth of the water. Yeah. Fifth so, of the water. Yeah. So it's 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 just it's incredible. I used to have to shut down the whole lower district and take the whole main canal ditch and give it to Ty on Saturday and Sunday yeah. because he needed that much water when we were at low water, like fifty percent. Yeah, he gilded me into this pivot. <laughs> I'm just a good salesman. <laughs> Apparently, you're also lucky enough that we should all ask you to buy us lottery tickets, but we'll do that afterwards. <laughs> so. All right, I think we have another question up front here. Thanks. I'm curious about the other modernization projects going on in some of the larger districts. I'm on Arnold, so I know they're working on piping, but I don't know what the status of that is, and I was curious if other districts are doing similar things. Yeah, do you want me to take this one? So... All eight irrigation districts in the Deschutes Basin have, at this point, accomplished or written what Mark referred to earlier, um, watershed plans, which are um, part of NRCS's, we call it the PL-566 program. Um, and that program is funding large-scale um, piping in all of the districts. And all the districts have... Um, different sized projects depending on the size of the district. Like, so for instance, Lone Pine Irrigation District, um, with that program and through the money allocated through the PL-566 program, they're able to modernize their entire district because it's a smaller district. Um, Central Oregon Irrigation District um, just got done piping eight miles of um, their main canal um, with that same slug of money. So, um, and then Arnold, do you remember how many miles of pipe yeah. Arnold is able to do? With yeah, so, so Arnold, Arnold um, just purchased uh, 16,600 feet of pipe to do the first phase, and then there's three more three-mile phases after that uh, following. So for the next four years, um, they'll be running, they'll be piping the majority of their, of their main canal, which will save just an absolute ton of water. Uh, Tumalo uh, and Swally are both, you know, way out in front, and um, it's just incredible the amount of pipe that they've all uh, put put in the ground. Um, so, you know, ultimately we we look to see the small districts like TSID and, and Tumalo and Swally and Arnold and Lone Pine all get pipe fairly quickly, and then that will you know get get us into the bigger projects at COID. Uh, and North Unit and 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 Ochico and it's just it's ju it's just it's amazing what we've been able to accomplish because we used to do you know one two three million dollar phases and uh, the 102 and 108 inch pipe that COID put in that was like a 33 million dollar phase it was just incredible. So the map on the right hand side with the pretty colored lines that um, the green line that is uh, labeled PB Canal. 
That's the Pilot Butte Canal in um, Central Oregon Irrigation District. And that green line represents the, um, the miles of pipe that they were able to do, along with the yellow, actually, I believe the yellow line was also, that's the J lateral, was also piped under the NRCS's PL566 program. And the, that piping has actually been completely accomplished at this point. It's done, um, and I believe that piping saved 30 CFS of water that's gonna be returning to the upper Deschutes Basin by way of North Unit. It's kind of a convoluted path, but essentially North Unit is gonna be able to use that water, and then in exchange, North Unit will be releasing 30 CFS from the upper Deschutes in the winter months to help restore that stretch of river. And then the pink line um, is the J lateral. Uh, let me see if I can get this to work over here. This right here. We just finished piping this literally like a few days ago under the RCPP program. They just put water in it, I believe, last Monday. So very exciting. And then the blue line that is going off of the um, green line is the L lateral, and that is going to be piped as, um, next year as part of this program. And then we're doing, we're working with NRCS to do on-farm flood to sprinkler conversions for folks and helping them tie in directly to this piping so that they can take advantage of all the benefits that we've talked about tonight. So. All right, another question over here. I'm a little curious how this is rolling out. Is it farmers first? It, sound, it would make sense that we help the farmers and are the farmers picked based on senior rights? Um, did Ty have to pay for this? Is this all funded? I'm just uh, <laughs> I'm okay. <funny>. Sorry. <laughs> so th this is a this is a very good question because um, uh, the first meetings back in April of '97 and that year was uh, we want to keep all the water. I said, well, that's good. How much money you got? And um, to date, TSID has piped put installed $50 million of infrastructure. And uh, currently we have a clean water evolving loan debt of $3 million. The hydros, the three hydros pay for 70% of that. And the farmers get charged $10 an acre. Uh, and the farmers also have some of the cheapest water in the state at $10 an acre foot. Um, However, we have instituted a uh, two-tier system. So if you use over your percentage, you have to use groundwater, and so you end up paying $40 additional an acre foot because that's what it costs to pump it out of the ground. So we've been able to actually get the farmers to work with NRCS and Central Electric Co-op doing on-farm efficiencies like drop downs on their pivots, changing nozzles on their wheel lines, obviously elim eliminating all of their pumps was a big help. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of people do stuff just voluntarily because of how expensive uh, the well water is. So yes, it is farmers first. And one of the things that I said to DRC on day one, I said, I wanna hear the word sustainable farming leading every paragraph. And I have to tell you that um, whether I was working with Scott McCullough or whether I <coughs> was working uh, with Andy and working with Brett, working with Kate, working with Jen, working now with Lisa, it has all been sustainable farming, helping the stream, helping fish, and basically working together to have a community solution. And as a result, um, the farmers, some of them had to spend some money. You know, I probably, I, I purchased three pivots on my place, and so I probably invested $100,000 on my 200 acres. Um, and, uh, but I also put in, I replaced six miles of rusting old steel pipe with 10 miles, uh, excuse me, 10 miles, listen to me. Um, six, sorry, 10,000 feet, replace 6,000 feet of rusting 12 inch steel with 10,000 feet of high density polyethylene. And one of the things about high density polyethylene is the reason I'm such an advocate on it is that it's got a shelf life of 100 to 1,000 years. Um, I've been ripping out PVC and steel and concrete for 25 years. And um, 
you know, this pipe has a safety factor of one and a half times. I have frozen it solid. And you can't hurt this. You can, you can punch a hole in it with a backhoe. And on occasion, a utility does that to me, and I make them pay dearly for that. But um, this is one of those things. We're unique. TSID, in 2009, we hired a full construction crew. We hired 10 people, and we purchased a million dollars of heavy iron. And so we have, been, we have installed all of our pipelines ourselves. In addition to the 62 miles that we've installed, we've done over 60 miles on on-farm pipe because we work with our farmers. And I will say this, my partnership with NRCS, I think, goes beyond. When we're done, of the 200 farms, there'll be over 170 equip on-farm contracts. And that has to do with the penetration that we've gotten and getting people to realize how important it is not just to pipe the lateral, but then to continue on, learn how to do irrigation water management, and do all the things that are needed to bring you up to 100% conservation. So I, I, I did have a, um, a cost share for the actual pivot. Um, not, none of the building of it or installation of the pipe to feed the pivot, but the actual pivot themselves, they just they came in these big wooden boxes and uh, uh, there was some cost sharing for that because I was a flutter and that was a, uh, but basically um, I hired the irrigation district to do a lot of the uh, work of, of putting in the pipes to the pivots and uh, NRCS designed all that and, and, and helped out with a lot of the engineering. It was a good combination. So I will say that we right now in that geographic area that I was just referring to, the, the Smith Rock Kingway geography, we're working in partnership with um, NRCS, and there there is money there for farmers who want to do um, conversions and upgrades. Um, so definitely reach out and get in touch with us. We also have partnered with Deschutes County um, and received some America Rescue Plan Act funding um, that's helping to pipe private laterals in that area. Um, the Oregon Water Resources Department has also come in with some match funding to help with piping. So um, the day-to-day, -day, when I'm not up here on the stage talking to you all about these projects, I am <laughs> managing grants and writing grants and managing grants and managing projects. <laughs> so um, yes, we are doing our absolute best to try to, to fundraise to make these projects possible with cost share for both the districts and the farmers. And we know it's great to put a really big pipe in the ground for a district on a district project, but unless you're getting that pipe to the ties out there in the world on the farms who need to use that water, um, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the job. So that's what we're working on day to day. So I don't know, we ha if we're almost out of time. Do we have any last remaining questions? I'll, I'll ask one question and then I can hand it off to you, ma'am. Um, and this is kind of tough because there's a lot of canals out there and Mark apparently you're a deadhead so you're a bit you know, spacey. Um, <laughs> but I'm kind of wondering, you know, we're talking about all these piping projects and all these canals in the basin. And do you have a rough estimate for how many or what percentage of the canals are actually piped versus what are open canals at this point? And how long do you think it'll take to, you know, pipe the majority of those? Well, so, so that the 700 miles, that's the target. There's really 1,500 miles. But when you... Counting, yeah, counting private laterals. private laterals, private laterals. meaning the, the beyond right. the diversion, like beyond the, the infrastructure that these guys are managing and, and, through the districts. And so we piped 30 miles of district canals, and we've piped 32 miles of private laterals, and we're finishing off the last three uh, in the next two years. So, um, you know, this took us, um, I won't say... 25 years because really things accelerated in 2009 when we did the majority of it. Um, but we're going to pipe all 11 miles of canals in Lone Pine in three years. Uh, TSID is working with them through an intergovernmental agreement. And so um, just letting you know that, uh, you know, there's going to be 76 miles done between those two districts and um, you know, that's a big chunk out of the 700. That's, you know, more than, more than 10%. So, and that's just little districts. I mean, you know, the eight miles that Craig did in, in the one 
in the one shot. And the J is probably multiple. I mean, it's a lot of miles, as well as the LLAT. Um, so anyway, the, the, it, it's, in the beginning, people said it wasn't doable. Um, but when you start figuring out, prior to us raising PL566 money, the districts had raised, you know, had already in, raised and installed probably close to $200 million of projects. We're now working on the next $200 million. That's not far away from the billion dollar goal, which is where we're heading. Excellent. Thank you. One more question back here. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I realized from the very beginning the um, data showing um, how much water is saved by doing the, the these piping projects is it's very compelling. Uh, and then at the end of your presentation, you talked about impacts of wildlife. Um, but I'd like to know more information about that. Are people um, doing the research to... Um, to look at the pros and cons of like what is being lost from the peripheral wetlands that stretch out through so so much of our land now, like not only for the deer but the mm -hmm. the frogs and the insects and the waterfowl, and um, I'm just interested in learning more about that. Yeah, most definitely. Though that's a really good question. Um, each and every one of the districts that do that is doing a large scale piping project. So all eight of the districts have written what we call watershed plans, and they're not named very well because they're not really a watershed plan. What they are is a, a NEPA analysis. The NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act, and it's basically the act that says that any project that uses federal dollars or happens on federal lands has to go through a full-blown environmental like analysis. Um, and so each of those watershed plans is, is in essence, um, it is an environmental analysis, an EA, um, and they are all available online. Um, you can find them all, I believe, at watersheds.org. Um, I will warn you, they're not, they're not the most readable documents. They're, <laughs> they're hundreds of pages long. But in each of those documents, they have analyzed for each of the piping projects all of the different um, impacts to wetlands, um, wildlife, uh, nesting birds, I mean, it, it, migratory birds, it goes, it goes on and on, more than I can list. Um, so I would direct you to that watersheds.org website. Um, and the good thing about those big um, documents is that they have amazing indices that in the back that can kind of, you can search for topics. Um, and so you can look for specifically what you're interested in. But yes, to answer your question, there have been full-blown environmental analyses happening on all of the projects, so. Yeah, and jurisdictional wetlands, um, there aren't a lot in Deschutes County. They're in South Deschutes County, um, but the inventory that the county maintains is mostly in informational, um, which is not jurisdictional. Um, you know, there are some swimming pools on that inventory. So, um, you know, one of the things that we did, because this is shows you how thorough that the EAs are in the watershed plans, they basically identified when we were building the McKenzie project that because there weren't a lot of the farmers hadn't built ponds in the McKenzie Canyon, that the NRCS would like to see three more ponds, and we built three more ponds. Since I've been at the district, we've gone from 80 farmers and 40 ponds to 200 farmers and 120 ponds. The ponds supply water to the deer 12 months out of the year. The canals are dry five to six months out of the year. So I appreciate the specious argument that the canals are feeding the deer. It's just not true, okay? If you've ever watched an osprey or an eagle try and fish in a canal, they usually, that's their last day on earth because they hit the nice basalt. They fish in our ponds, though, very happily. And, um, uh, you know, we're going through this with, you know, the deer winter range and overlay. It's the farms that feed the wildlife. It's why the wildlife is here, because of the farms. And so creating sustainable agriculture will create sustainable wildlife. And sustainable rivers. And sustainable okay. rivers for the wildlife in the rivers. We're gonna, we, we have to wrap it up because of respect for your time. Thank you so much. I just two quick points. One, um, we just heard on Friday that we got another grant from the Bureau of Reclamation 
a couple and a half million to pipe more laterals and COID as well as Arnold and increased measurement. So we're just gonna, Lisa's gonna keep <laughs> rolling these projects forward. And also that Mark um, runs the most successful dry year leasing program that we have with any district where we incentivize patrons and pay more in dry years to lease water and stream. And I think that's because Thank of the you, ab Jen. ability to, and, and yeah, Jen with the DRC, ability to do that partly because of all this infrastructure work. So these things work together. Um, just want to thank you so much for being here tonight, and let's give our panelists a round of applause. All right. Hopefully we'll see you all at the next one on May 22nd.